would like to, ha I, have, I have a few announcements. Um, as we all know, the positivity rate in Maryland is now 2% and inpatient cases at University of Maryland actually have only been at eight in-house uh, COVID positive patients for the past two days, so really low. It's hard to believe that maybe four weeks ago we had 150 COVID cases in our hospital, 50% of which was were they were either in ICU beds or on ventilators, very sick folks. So we've seen a rapid fall in cases across the nation and Maryland of course is, le is leading the plummet, which is always great. Um, so as most of, if not all of you are aware, the campus announced as of today uh, that masks are no longer required in most university spaces and the no meals at events has been lifted. Uh, masks, however, remain optional um, for those of you that feel more comfortable um, wearing them. And because we know the CDC has clearly uh, stated that if you are around unmasked folks and you don't know their status or you think you're increased vulnerability, not an N95 is your best protection. It's very, very good protection. But that said, uh, we don't have to wear them on campus. There are some, I'll clarify that further. However, masks still remain required in all patient care areas, all clinical areas and lobbies. Any in-person healthcare simulation lab as well as on UMB or UMMC public transportation. So we still need to wear masks in those settings. Uh, further announcements from the medical center are anticipated. Um, however, as we saw, if you may have seen in an announcement last night from the system, even though the CDC and the campus have announced uh, a dropping of mask requirements, as we've seen across all counties in the state. Healthcare is a different setting and that usually opens up much slower. So uh, stay posted for that. But for right now in clinical areas around patient care, all this, the uh, requirements for masking and eyewear remain the same. So what does all of this mean for us? Uh, the timing could not be better. Um, so I just want to give a heads up. Our Taylor lecture, which is in two weeks on March 17th, we will be um, uh, hosting uh, Dr. Daniel Weintraub to do our Taylor lecture. He, back in the fall, said he would be happy to come, but didn't want to come unless he could do it in person. So we were crossing our fingers and holding our breath that that would be able to happen. And sure enough, it has. Um, and we promised him that we would have uh, an audience for him. So we are going to do our very first hybrid grand rounds on the 17th, uh, where individuals uh, are, are welcome to join remotely. Uh, it will be a, a little bit of an experiment uh, in managing questions and that kinds of things, but I'm sure we'll work through it with our great IS team. But we need a, an audience. And so what I've asked is we will have up to 50 people at the campus center. Um, we will be providing some form of lunch. We thought it was going to be a grab and go lunch. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I have to work out those details. But what I do need is people to make a commitment um, to attend in person if it's doable for you. So folks on this campus, um, I really appreciate it. There is an RSVP for that. Call me and my assistant and let us know whether or not you in attend, intend to apply, to attend in person. Sorry about that. Really important that we have a good audience. Um, another, just another quick reminder um, is that uh, next week, we have our bi-monthly faculty meeting. Um, it remains remote. Um, Dean Reese will be joining us. So I wanted to remind folks about that um, to uh, plan to attend. And also, um, I'm going to be sending out a seven question, very brief survey to all faculty um, about how we communicate preferences. Seven questions shouldn't take you more than two, three minutes, and I appreciate if people would fill that out. Um, how we move forward with our grand rounds 
from this will be determined after our 17th grand rounds to see how the hybrid model worked. We have such great attendance, attendance that I, I don't want to remove that. I want to make it accessible uh, for faculty. So we're going to probably remain um, remote, but we'd like to go to a hybrid. So we'll see how it works. So moving on with the more important things for today. Today is a very intriguing talk about our department's response to the pandemic presented by our very own Dr. Stephanie Knight. Dr. Knight completed her undergraduate degree in biology at McDaniel College and her medical degree at Tulane University School of Medicine. After a life-changing experience of going through Hurricane Katrina, Dr. Knight selected psychiatry as her focus and returned to her home state, Maryland, to attend our residency training program from which she graduated in 2011. She spent her first five years um, as a full-time inpatient attending physician at the downtown campus and was also a regular uh, provider in our uh, psychiatric emergency services uh, for several years. When the Department of Psychiatry was asked to take over and lead the psychiatry program at the Midtown campus, it was Dr. Knight who answered the call to help us. It was a real challenge converting a community hospital setting to an academic institution, mind thought. Um, and at, as she fought bias from all sides, inside and out of our department. She has built a dynamic program with strong dedicated faculty, training programs, and a growing array of clinical services. Further, Dr. Knight has provided well over 10,000 hours of lectures and in-person clinical teaching to more than 90 resident psychiatrists and psychiatry uh, advanced practitioners and has accumulated over 7,000 hours of medical student teaching with hundreds of students over the last 11 years. She has been the recipient of many teaching and leadership awards, including the Walter Weintraub Teaching of the Year Award in 2012, the School of Medicine Student Council Award for Best Clinical Faculty in 2014, the Virginia Huffer Postgraduate Teaching Award in 2014, and the Physician uh, Colleague Award for UMMC Midtown in 2019. Also in 2019, Dr. Knight was the first psychiatrist selected for the UMM for the system level physician leadership fellowship program. She completed that program in March of last year and continues to work towards her certification as a physician executive. Dr. Knight's skills, however, remain endless and they don't end there as she demonstrated her creativity and outside outside of medicine as evident in her most recent award for her painting Awakenings, which was awarded the best in show prize in the 2021 Healing Arts Exhibit at the Medical Center. So we are very proud of her. Dr. Knight's current focus on acute psychiatry care and the delivery of collaborative model of multidisciplinary multi-specialty care is where she stands now. She has served as the chief of psychiatry at the University of Maryland Midtown campus and has paved the way along with other departmental leaders through the pandemic. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephanie Knight as she presents how we turned never into now, the rapid and intentional manifestation of a COVID-19 psychiatric unit. Dr. Knight. Thank you. That's I appreciate the introduction. Um, and I'm very honored to be able to give uh, this grand rounds today. It absolutely would not have been possible without the vast majority of people on the call. And I will uh, fully intend to thank those who are coming to mind, but would ask for your grace in knowing that not everyone will come to mind right away in this setting. So I will probably miss people and I apologize if I do. Um, but we were very honored not only to give grand rounds today, um, but to be able to offer you a panel discussion toward the end and the opportunity to ask questions of the panelists. The folks who were involved in the panel were intimately uh, part of the creation and standing up of the unit, which we did in a number of days, um, which was a feat in and of itself. So um, hopefully this 
presentation will also encourage more visits and tours to the Midtown unit. We're very happy to offer those to folks who haven't been up to the Midtown psychiatry units. Um, and I would also like to challenge the, the audience this afternoon. There are always things that we could be doing better. There are always things that um, we would like to add to our program, additional services research that we might be interested in. And so if anything in the presentation this afternoon sparks an idea, then please reach out to me. Our um, fantastic program specialist, Gabby Robinson, is also a, a great person to reach out to. So we want your involvement and your ideas. So if something is sparked, then uh, don't let that escape you without letting us know about it because we're always happy to collaborate. So without further ado, um, how we turned never into now. And actually the title is courtesy of Sarah Kubel, the, the Psych Admissions Manager. And that really was how a lot of this was um, framed in that we really were not interested um, in all of the complexities and challenges associated with opening up a, a COVID positive psych unit until we were, and it, it pretty much happened overnight. Um, so thank you for your attention. So I don't have any disclosures to provide. Um, and hopefully by the end of our talk today, then you'll be more familiar with the impact of the pandemic on patients with serious mental illness, as well as some of the uh, programmatic modifications, staffing changes, facilities, um, edits that we had to put in place in order to make an inpatient psychiatric unit safe for people who were struggling with psychiatric symptoms and, oh, by the way, had COVID. Um, so. I would absolutely not have any semblance of a PowerPoint to present without my co-conspirators who you see listed in somewhat random order. Um, Gabby Robinson, our program specialist, Dr. Stephanie Hare, one of the instructors at MPRC, Dr. Rock Beisel, uh, Dr. Reeves, our vice chair of clinical of uh, research services, and then um, uh, Dr. Rakshan, who's one of the assistant research scientists at UMBC. So thank you very much to all of you. Also thanks to the village, the village that you see on the left, that long list. Those are people who are interacting with our patients and providing care on the units any given day. So we have a very large multidisciplinary team and really inpatient care would not be possible without that number of people. Um, the hexagons on the right actually are the additional folks that we brought in in order to make modifications for the COVID unit. And we'll talk about um, each of those. Many of them are represented on, in the audience today and I appreciate that. So we'll, we'll look, we'll discuss the national and state trends in um, COVID infections, as well as the impact on folks with SMI and then our program modifications. And we'll follow it up hopefully with the last um, 30 minutes with a panel. So the, the larger context of this, uh, the national trends of COVID infection. So as of this morning, actually, um, the COVID cases in the US, you can see the, the density map right there. And uh, with the highest number, the darkest colors of red being around 37,000 um, confirmed cases in that area. The regional, more regional COVID cases, and this is where it becomes more and more relevant for university and all of our system facilities. The regional cases are um, still quite high, although new cases uh, are certainly slowing down and we're grateful for that for sure. Uh, within our state, more specifically, um, if you go to the next slide. Then we have, you can see kind of the, the larger angle of the state. We have a variety of colors of blue on there, right? So, so down in PG County, Montgomery County, there are a lot of um, cases that have been confirmed, either cases by county that were confirmed through the state COVID dashboard. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, then you'll see a little bit more of a zoomed in image. So uh, the Baltimore city, um, vicinity, which is the uh, kind of squared area in the center of the screen, had about 10,500 cases um, as of today. So you can see in the area, that is our typical kind of referring region for patients that are admitted. And so um, 
the number of cases outside of the city is just as relevant for psychiatry at Midtown um, as the number of cases within because we take folks onto the units from all over the state. The, um, the combination of inpatient psychiatry and COVID care or infection prevention um, tenants that are required uh, to treat COVID patients are really kind of in conflict. Um, and yet the, the system and some of the regional facilities have been able to offer some COVID positive psychiatric beds. Um, University of Maryland Laurel actually has had anywhere from 10 to 12 beds that have remained continuously open for over a year and a half at this point. Um, they uh, staff their unit using psychiatric nurses. They also use a contracted psychiatric um, group to provide the inpatient care. And um, Dr. Trudy Hall is the, is the fantastic woman um, running the show over there. She's, uh, I believe the CMO or the executive. Um, and she was very uh, critical in helping us stand up some of the background information, providing the background information for standing up the unit. So those 12 beds at Laurel have remained continuously open and they stay open. Um, we opened our unit on uh, the 12th of January and we provided 18 beds, which to my knowledge was the largest concentration of COVID positive inpatient psychiatry beds in the state. Um, the other units that were opened kind of intermittently throughout the course of the pandemic included Howard County General, which had a maximum of eight beds. They opened earlier in one of the surges, closed, reopened, and now have since closed again. Um, and MedStar Harbor also opened, I believe, uh, 10 beds uh, during the surge, but they're also now closed. So within our system, we were fortunate um, to have been led, are fortunate to, to be led by Dr. Rockweisel. And we started meeting as a system group amongst all of the departments of psychiatry um, right before the pandemic started. And uh, each system facility adopted a little bit of a different approach to um, how to provide care for patients who had psychiatric illness and needed a COVID positive environment. Um, and I appreciate it. I've seen some familiar names on the call. So I appreciate that our colleagues have logged in today. Um, and I certainly welcome their commentary uh, toward the end as well. But uh, the vast majority of our sister facilities were able to kind of carve out physical spaces within their inpatient units or within their psych EDs where patients who happen to be positive for COVID could receive psychiatric care. Um, however, the space was limited for many of those facilities. And so we ended up, as you'll see a little bit later, we ended up accepting a number of patients from within the system. About half of the patients that we accepted to Six North, the COVID positive unit came from within our system EDs. So why this particular um, criteria were really essential to address it is multifactorial. But we all know that serious mental illness or severe mental illness is an independent risk factor for developing severe symptoms of COVID. Um, very early in the pandemic, there were um, trends, little uh, unfortunate boluses of or clusters of cases that were that were um, popping up in March and April. So the example that that comes to mind was there was a little less than 1,500 COVID positive cases at one of the state psychiatric facilities at, or at any state psychiatric facility, um, which was twice the number of uh, COVID positive cases in federal prisons at the same time. That is actually under reporting the numbers because 16 states didn't answer that survey. So that is only data from um, a little more than half of our uh, states in the country. And still with that, we had more cases than uh, the federal prison system alone. So it is a very real uh, risk within an inpatient psychiatric unit. Um, and SMI is a risk factor for COVID for a number of reasons. One of them is that um, already before COVID, uh, we all know that our 
the folks that we treat with SMI have a shorter life expectancy, anywhere from 15 to 25 years in some studies. This is due to a variety of factors, but includes a higher incidence of tobacco use, um, all of the metabolic and cardiac side effects of antipsychotic medications certainly contribute to a higher morbidity mortality. Um, there's the oft-referenced unhealthy behaviors and lifestyles, um, which I actually dislike the phrasing of that. I think it sounds, um, uh, it has a derogatory edge to it, depending on how you tone your voice, I guess. But um, there are many challenges related to social determinants of health, access to um, quality healthcare and food, nutrition, support services, transportation. Um, there's a lot of things that folks are struggling with on a daily basis that contribute to their shorter life expectancy. Um, and so certainly COVID coming along has increased everyone's stress level, SMI aside, but in those folks who also have SMI, in addition to this new stress, um, there are now higher rates of depression, there's higher rates of um, suicidal thoughts, anxiety disorders. Uh, people are coping any way that they can. And so for a lot of people, that means uh, relapsing in their substance use um, or, or uh, having a, a problem with their substance use, having that develop into actual pathology. Um, and just having SMI or substance use disorder actually increases the risk of contracting COVID. Um, which was what a number of studies have found in 2020 and 2021. Uh, as I previously referenced, there's a lot of medical comorbidities that are the consequence of some of the medications that we use to treat um, serious mental illnesses. There, there was a, um, a paper from Vi in 2021 that uh, referenced actually a higher mortality from COVID if someone had a psychotic or mood disorder um, or had been exposed to antipsychotic or anxiolytic treatments. Um, and those two don't always necessarily coincide. People actually could be exposed to antipsychotics or anxiolytics without having a primary psychotic and mood disorder because the prescription of those medications are not restricted to um, psychiatric providers. Uh, we also know that substance use disorders increase the risk of hospitalization for COVID. So that's an issue as well. Um, so Dr. Ruth Shim was uh, a wonderful speaker that we had several, I think, months ago through um, Dr. Forrester's um, uh, Grand Rounds uh, with DEI, and she had she published a paper with another author, Stephen uh, Starks, in 2020, in um, yeah, in 2020, in Psychiatric Services, and I would highly recommend it. Uh, it's actually a fantastic paper. I'm happy to provide. I think the references are at the end of the slides, but um, I'm not even going to attempt to paraphrase Dr. Shim. So oppressed and marginalized communities, including Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people have higher rates of infection, hospitalization, and mortality uh, compared with white people. This is in COVID. And so this, the impact of the pandemic really goes beyond uh, just a diagnosis of SMI, but in a larger and, and still racist infrastructure of care, then um, people are suffering um, just by who they are and the circumstances in which they were uh, uh, growing up or currently living. The, um, the COVID pandemic in particular, uh, Dr. Shim points out, actually uh, is an extremely unfortunate um, and deadly example of the confluence of all of these factors, right? So the structural racism, social determinants of health, um, higher rates of psychiatric and substance use disorders all result in kind of a, another layer of a pandemic. Um, and this certainly makes attention to these matters even more um, desperately needed. So we absolutely wanted to be able to provide uh, psychiatric care to patients who also happen to have COVID. And we wanted to, to try to initiate, we wanted to initiate that and then maintain it and improve it. And that's kind of the phase that we're in now because we would like to not contribute to the disparities that we know that exist between regions based on access um, or demographics or uh, social determinants of health. We wanna be part of the solution as opposed to the problem. 
Um, and so I mentioned before, we, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, were pretty determined to not uh, be the ones to bear the burden of figuring out how to create a COVID positive psych unit. Um, and I'm, I am using that phrase, but I also wanna be clear that what we ultimately were, were very proud to offer was inpatient psychiatry for people who had a side of COVID, as we like to say, or had, oh, by the way, also were, were COVID positive. We, um, I'll talk a little bit later in the presentation, we actually um, kind of narrowed our uh, criteria for medical stability so that we were not accepting patients who could suddenly become medically compromised as a result of their COVID, because the reality is that we, did, we were not able to change uh, or even try to change the somatic care that was offered uh, at Midtown at the same time. So we were like many other facilities in the area, short on med surge beds, short on ED beds, short staffed. And so we did not wanna be in the position where we were accepting patients that we could not safely provide high quality care for. Um, so I say COVID positive psychiatry, but it's really like continuing to provide inpatient psychiatric care, but people happen to also have COVID. But all that, uh, all that being the case, fit testing uh, was one of the unexpected hurdles early in the pandemic and actually was quite difficult um, to get when things first started uh, in March and April of 2020, because there was an assumption that people who were working within the Department of Psychiatry wouldn't be providing care for COVID positive patients or uh, patients who were uh, under investigation for having COVID, right? PUIs, patients under investigation. Um, and so I actually personally was turned down at least twice by um, folks who were doing fit testing because they said, oh, well, you don't need that. So it was with support from hospital leaders and Dr. Rockbeisel and department leaders that we. Um, uh, gently clarified that you know we we absolutely wanted to be part of the solution and we we needed to be fit tested so that we could provide care because COVID wasn't going to discriminate between specialties or any other aspect of, of patients. Um, the unfortunate reality still exists, however, that the fit testing doesn't cross campuses. So Midtown actually offers different masks in the um, automated uh, mask machines than downtown campus. So if you were fit tested at downtown campus and you have like a little bit of an unusual mask that you were approved to use, you may have to be fit tested again at Midtown because the mask that you have been assigned may not be available in the machine. And so um, some of those logistical challenges actually could be um, difficult to, to overcome at times. Thank goodness we had such a multidisciplinary team to be able to do that. Of course, there are concerns um, from patient from uh, staff who are used to working in psychiatric units about providing care for folks who have such a potentially complex somatic ailment. And there is a, a very nice um, paper in psychiatric research in 2020 from Bojdani, and they actually surveyed um, people across the country, uh, both psychiatrists and um, other inpatient psychiatric staff and outpatient actually, about what were their concerns about providing a care to folks who were COVID positive. And some of the quotes uh, you can see on the screen. So folks were worried about, um, you know, working within a system where transmission risk wasn't um, minimized at that point. And they were concerned about risks to themselves. Um, you can see in the second bullet point, there were ethical questions that were brought up. So uh, we all want to provide patients with inform information so they can make an informed decision about any number of things for their health care. But if they're agreeing to be admitted to a unit voluntarily, what are we telling them about their COVID risk in an inpatient environment so that we know they're making an informed decision to be admitted to the hospital at that time? Um, I'm not sure that there was anything that was standardized uh, that I've seen in, in any um, academic institution or community facility. But certainly if someone knows of something, I'd, I'd love to get an email from you about it um, because I don't think that we ever really figured out the answer to that ethical question. 
Um, and then the third bullet point, if I'm trained to be a physician and I, uh, am I guilty of not serving my profession if I don't go to the front lines and provide that, that kind of service? So these were all the questions that people were asking themselves and one another and many more, I'm sure. Um, apologies for the density of text on this, but um, the, there was a, a lot of, um, kind of anecdotal publications in 2020 and 2021 related to uh, different uh, units that did ultimately offer care early on in the pandemic to patients who needed psychiatric care and were COVID positive. Um, it was clear from these anecdotal uh, experiences that there were a number of uh, values and shared ideals uh, that would render these programs successful. So multidisciplinary approach was absolutely one of them. Um, a shared ethos of responsibility, um, you know, being able to empower one another and educate one another, share knowledge, um, open communication, uh, things like that. So these are things which I, I think each of us probably hopes to do every day in, in our professional and personal lives, but they really require extra effort and attention to be done during a pandemic when everyone's stress level is not at its normal baseline. It's, it's already elevated. And so it takes uh, particular attention and care to remain true to these tenants. Um, and we'll continue to look back on those as we proceed uh, through the pandemic, kind of regardless of where it, where it goes. Um, one of the first things that we put into place, um, and I'll speak in a moment about why this is challenging sometimes for folks with SMI, but one of the first things that we put into place was to try to um, screen out patients who were actively symptomatic, who posed a transmission risk, who would pose a transmission risk if they were um, found to be COVID positive incidentally on the unit or if they had, had higher risk factors. So before we opened the unit, we were screening patients um, using these questions or, or similar ones. So we always asked, asked people um, about whether they had symptoms, were they exposed to anybody who was a high risk? Had they traveled outside of Maryland recently in, in the preceding two weeks that they had a positive test? And then ultimately once the vaccines became available, then were they vaccinated, was the patient vaccinated? And staff would ask these questions and then document the answers in the medical record so that we would have on file a way to reference uh, kind of a rough estimate. Is this patient um, going to be a safe addition uh, somatically to the inpatient psychiatry unit? Again, this was um, before we opened Six North where we were not accepting uh, any COVID positive patients. These questions continue to be asked of all people referred for admission even today. Um, the challenge though, uh, if you'll, you'll see on the next slide, is a lot of folks who need psychiatric admission need it because their symptoms are so severe that their life is significantly impacted. And many times the elements of their life that, that's impacted are their ability to communicate accurate um, or or detailed information about how they're feeling or what's been happening with them recently, thought disorganization, executive functioning challenges, things like that. So we had a lot of people who presented uh, to the emergency department or were referred from other emergency departments in the state who actually couldn't answer these questions because, uh, because of the intensity of their psychiatric symptoms. And so what do you do then? That was a question that we were often faced with. And uh, ultimately the answer to that question was we typically would ask their next of kin or their loved one or their group home manager, whoever was in the best position to provide informed and accurate answers is who we uh, deferred to. Um, so we also did a very regimented um, uh, COVID test, uh, like pre-admission COVID testing. So admission to the COVID negative unit always required a negative COVID test, uh, a variety of hours before admission, anywhere from 48 to 96, depending on the um, transmission rates in the community at the time. Um, and so currently what we're doing is that a, a negative test is required no more than 48 hours prior to the patient's time of admission. 
um, because of that will likely change as we um, go down in our risk level. So um, there were many reasons why there was some reluctance early in the pandemic about opening a facility that was for COVID positive patients. Um, the modalities of care uh, were really some of the higher hurdles, right? So um, close contact between patients and staff in an inpatient psychiatric unit is expected. We are checking on them every 15 minutes. There's a sitter who's within arm's length. There's group therapy where patients actually benefit from being in a large group setting, sit, seated next to one another in a circle discussing, you know, the, the challenges that they have every day or the symptoms that they're struggling with. Those, all of those things are completely opposed to the infection prevention um, rules and guidelines for COVID care. Um, and so addressing those is a huge hurdle. Uh, visitors usually were welcomed and were kind of a source of familiarity and refuge for patients, but in COVID times, visitors are an actual threat to uh, the health and wellness of anyone on the inpatient unit, which operates more, uh, it's more akin to a nursing home um, than anything else. So the uh, exposure risks we needed to minimize, but that also includes reducing um, non-essential visitors or trainees or staff. And so students of, of any number of disciplines um, had to be for a period of time restricted from the unit early in the pandemic. And then there's the familiarity of our system um, by hospital leadership and system leadership, um, which was a hurdle we, we were able to overcome pretty early on, thank goodness. Um, disposition planning is difficult in pandemics because there are fewer housing resources available as well. Um, next slide. I realize we are almost short on time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little faster if I if I can. Um, some of the other challenges that are created uh, when you're mixing COVID positive care and inpatient psychiatry include the actual symptoms of the patients themselves, right? So if they were admitted, they were admitted because their symptoms were so severe that they couldn't safely receive care anywhere else. Poor impulse control, executive functioning challenges, inability or unwillingness to mask. Um, these are all major um, challenges and continue to be major challenges even today. Rough estimate of patients who are compliant with masking on the inpatient unit is about 50%. Um, and so once we created the COVID positive unit, that didn't, I mean, it, it certainly mattered, but a person who was unwilling to mask or unable to mask was no longer a risk to the other patients on the unit because the other patients on the unit were already uh, COVID positive or COVID recovered and therefore safe from addition, from infection. There we had it. Um, so this was one of the things that also enabled us to kind of resume um, things as normal as much as possible. So patients were able to come out of their rooms and go to groups if, the, if it was understood that everyone already had COVID who was admitted to the unit. Um, the design of inpatient psychiatry units are uh, meant to encourage community, encourage dialogue and social interactions. We try to role model those things for patients. And with infection prevention, um, goals and guidelines in mind, none of that can happen. So, so that is also a challenge. Um, the milieu environment is something that is relatively foreign to other specialties. So um, informing people about that was also something we had to do on a daily basis. We also can't require that people stay in their room. Uh, that would be considered a violent restraint according to CMS and Joint Commission. So that is also something that we, we are actively addressing. Um, I really liked the quote from Gessen, and I'll, I'll end this, this portion of the slide with that. The prevention of solitude is built into the architecture of psych units and enshrined in the laws and regulations that govern them. Psych units are often designed to facilitate communication and group activities. Now, however, they seem as if they were designed to spread the virus. There were... Um, uh, there, we had several clusters of COVID positive patients that popped up throughout the course of the pandemic. And there was always a question uh, from staff, um, you know, are we 
getting it from them or are they getting it from us? And this continues to be an active dialogue. Um, the community case rates being so high and knowing that patients are negative when they're admitted to a COVID negative unit um, implies that staff are unknowingly um, bringing COVID into the unit from the community. Um, but not everyone uh, considered that, they, not everyone believed that to be true. And so uh, those dialogues were always, um, were challenging at times. Um, but I think everyone is interested in safety uh, at the end of the day. And that's something that we can reinforce with education and communication. Um, so we talked about a lot, of, a lot of this already. One of the, um, some of the other challenges briefly that I'll highlight were um, common area meals and snacks. So communal meals is one, are one of the um, uh, foundations of inpatient psychiatry. And that is the time when transmission of COVID actually occurs most frequently is during meals. And so people were, for the first time um, in my career that I had experienced, people were told that they needed to eat in their rooms, uh, which could be a very isolating activity. Um, we go to the next slide, please. Uh, so some of the things that we were fortunate at Midtown to not have to deal with, um, but Dr. Morano and many other colleagues on the call uh, did have did struggle with some of these um, at the downtown campus, is that at Midtown we have all single rooms, um, everyone has their own bathroom, and we restricted visitors very early on. Um, uh, we also, the design of the Midtown unit was such that we, um, despite many frustrations from various uh, staff and other departments of the hospital, we were very stingy with access to the unit even before the pandemic because of elopement precautions and elopement risk of patients. And so we really, we require that people, that myself or the nurse manager sign off on access for anyone that's requesting access to the sixth floor from outside of psychiatry. And the reason for that is multifactorial now because now that is just one more person who could bring in something that's transmissible. Um, the, I, I did think the other day, so we renovated the units at Midtown in January, 2019. And it's a good thing that we did because on the fifth floor, uh, everyone, there were three bathrooms for 28 patients. Um, everyone shared a room. So there were two patients to a room. And I'm just imagining the, the facilities modifications that would have been required, I think would have prevented inpatient care. Uh, pretty significantly at Midtown uh, had we not had the fortune of renovating the unit. So next slide. Um, so these are some of the things that we did in order to mitigate transmission before we opened the unit. We go to the next slide, Gabby. Um, we also, uh, when we had clusters, we would often do test to stay of staff, um, frequent cleaning of high touch services, things like that. Um, the, so this essentially is, uh, there's a quote from Bojani that was uh, re essentially referencing that the modifications required to render uh, a unit less um, apt to transmission of any infectious disease, but particularly COVID, the modifications put in place, meals in your rooms, you know, limited group programming, things like that, actually might render inpatient hospitalization less effective. And so um, there's, to my knowledge, not any definitive studies related to that specifically, but it is something that we need to be actively considering. So what did we see on our units? Um, so we opened um, the six North COVID positive unit on January 12th, and it remained open to admissions through February 1st. And anecdotally, um, during that period of time, we noticed that the, uh, there was a different diagnostic spectrum for patients who were admitted to the COVID positive side. Um, I will say that the admission data from referring facilities, the, diag the admission diagnosis in particular, doesn't always reflect that um, because frankly, it's not always accurate. And so we're getting uh, diagnoses from folks outside of the specialty who are well-intended, but perhaps misinformed about what a symptom might actually consist of. And so someone may have, in fact, um, 
a substance induced psychotic disorder, but they're labeled with schizophrenia. And so that changes some of the reports unless you dig a little deeper. Um, so anecdotally, there were uh, different diagnoses, um, rise in substance use disorders, um, access to personality disorders as well, and overall um, a shorter length of stay. I saw many more three and four day admissions than I normally had at Midtown. So we're continuing to, to um, crunch the numbers related to the, the two plus weeks that we had the unit open. And hopefully we'll report back um, at a later time with lots more colorful graphs and um, information related to the, the difference in the units during that time. We have a couple of those now. Let me go to the next one, Gabby. So um, there was a shift um, in the, in the race distribution of patients who were admitted to the unit uh, six South, which is COVID, COVID negative or COVID recovered, and six North, which is COVID positive. Um, so there were, over that course of um, 20 days, there were 22 patients admitted to the COVID negative side and 35 patients admitted to the COVID positive side. Um, but you can see that there's there are some differences in the pie charts there in terms of uh, diagnosis and also um, the racial distribution. Stephanie, sorry to interrupt. This is Gloria. Before you switch over to the panel discussion, there was a question in the chat earlier about adverse childhood events or ACEs. Do you do you track that on the unit or any thoughts about relevance to some of the issues you described about how patients were responding to COVID related issues? So we screen everyone on the unit for a history of um, traumatic events or uh, and PTSD symptoms, but it's actually, it's not a, a, a data point that's actively collected. It's actually uh, and, and analyzed on a, a unit level, it's on an individual level. So that's a good question um, and actually sounds like a fantastic um, research question if anyone is interested in pursuing that. Um, because offhand, I, I don't know, uh, since we focus on just the individual when it comes to trauma, but. And for these slides in the next set, can you comment which, if any, of these unit differences are actually statistically significant? So we're still working on, we're still working on um, the data analysis, actually. Um, so I, I don't offhand know. I apologize. Um, so we did have, uh, this is the, this actually uh, compares the uh, percentages of the tox screens on, on the unit. Actually, we had um, uh, the most common, uh, commonly used substance or commonly found substance on a urine toxicology was um, cannabis. Um, and then cannabis and Benzos also was popping up more frequently than I had seen um, anecdotally in years past. Um, and actually, I think so. This was just kind of an overview of some of the the surges in the past. Um, we can skip that part, and then so vaccines. So let's talk briefly about that before we go. We'll take a five minute break and go to the panel. Actually, we might just go right to the panel because of time. Um, so the opportunity to vaccinate patients is, is something that we were able uh, to start uh, midway through, uh, shortly after all of uh, us were mandated for vaccines and we were able to offer those for inpatients. Um, however, the vaccination rates for folks with SMI um, generally are lower than the population and certainly in the folks that we provided care for during the 20 days that the COVID positive unit was open, um, there were very few patients that actually were vaccinated to any degree, only about 44%. Um, so if you, uh, if you go to the next slide, Gabby. Uh, so sorry, this was the additional um, breakdown of demographics. Um, which we briefly covered already. You can go to the next one. And then in terms of inpatient vaccinations, that is um, uh, 
I didn't add data to the slide because there's not much of it available. Um, the reports we've requested that a report be built specific to our inpatient unit, um, because what we found is that a lot of patients are not, so they're asked about vaccinations before they get to the hospital from the screening, screening questions that you saw earlier. Uh, most patients don't remember at that time. I don't know that I would remember if I didn't have my cell phone ready to look at my chart and tell you when I got vaccinated. Um, so most folks didn't actually know their vaccination information. Um, and as a result, we could query their immunization history, um, but the vast majority of folks, it was not available um, in the systems that we que query to gather this information or they had not been vaccinated, um, but they were in such a condition psychiatrically when they were admitted that when the nursing staff or the providers or physicians would inquire about whether they were interested in receiving the vaccine, they may not have understood the question. They may have dismissed the question or felt like it was intrusive. They, they uh, were not willing to receive the vaccine or able to receive it one way or the other. Um, and so our vaccination rates on the unit are, you know, we, we kind of go in little clusters of two or three. But right now, for example, uh, we have 18 patients on the on um, one of our units. It's now a COVID negative slash COVID recovered unit again. Um, but no one on the unit right now has received a vaccination um, during their stay. About half have been uh, in an appropriate state of mind to be queried about whether or not they were interested, but none of those accepted according to um, the information that the nursing staff are submitting. So we have a lot of work to do in this area. And I think this is um, one of the many opportunities for health services researchers on the call who may be interested in helping out with those kinds of efforts, even motivational interviewing related to vaccines. There's all sorts of things we could do. So, um, I think I think I'm going to stop right there. Uh, and there are more slides, but I, I really want to commit to the panel. So um, if it's okay, Dr. Reeves and Dr. Rakbaza, we could take a five minute break um, while Dave sets up the, the panel screen and then we'll move to that phase. Stephanie, do you want to field a few questions while you're setting that up? Sure, yeah, we can do that. Is that okay, Dave? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So folks can enter in the chat, but I wonder, Stephanie, if I could squeeze in a quick question about um, staff turnover. And mm -hmm. we've certainly heard a lot about nursing shortages and, and other factors. And I'm wondering um, your, your perspective on, on how that impacted your decision-making about the unit and where, where things stand with that currently. So that's a, that is a really good question. We have on the panel, um, Dr. Gray Raymond and Tara Collins, who may be able to speak more specifically um, to the nursing staff in particular, uh, which is both the, the largest quantity of, of staff within a discipline and also had a, a significant turnover in terms of um, uh, even just staff shifting from regular full-time staff to PRN staff, there was a significant shift in that. And a lot of that uh, related back to factors that many on the call have heard, um, you know, competing systems being willing to offer uh, tremendously high salaries or hourly rates, um, traveling um, companies being, being willing to pay people uh, quite impressive hourly rates, but to work elsewhere. And so a lot of people um, took those opportunities understandably when, when handed to them. But I think one of the consequences of that, of course, is short being short staffed. Um, but it's also, even when you're able to fill those uh, voids with new employees, the multidisciplinary nature of an inpatient team means that kind of familiarity with one another and um, ex shared experience are huge um, and critical elements in terms of the functioning of a team. And so when you have new members to the team, that's great. Uh, but it, there is a bit of an adjustment period for both the, the people who they're joining and the person who is joining. And so uh, a lot of that um, 
uh, learning curve sometimes is needs to be accelerated, but can't be. And so that adds another layer of complexity to the care provided. Stephanie, it looks like your A-team has arrived. All right. That is fantastic. Okay, so, um, so without further ado, and I think we, Dr. Guyton, um, our chief nursing officer at Midtown was not able to join us, unfortunately. Um, we have a fantastic panel uh, that we are able to offer and I thank each of them for joining us today. So we have, I'm just gonna go in order of, of my screen. We have uh, Ms. Sarah Kubel, who is a psych social, psych LCSWC, who's currently our manager of the psych admissions office that coordinates admissions from both downtown and midtown campuses. We have Ms. Rachel Prouty, who's our um, LMSW, one of our inpatient psych social workers and also our representative at the involuntary commitment hearings. She represents the hospital for those cases. We have um, Kish Kavanaugh, who is our manager of infection prevention at Midtown and was really uh, the go-to person for any question at any hour on any day <laughs> throughout um, the opening of the Sixth North Unit. Um, we have Ms. Chrissy Coastal, who was our, one of our psych OTs in the inpatient unit and um, really spearheaded a lot of the shifts in programming and modalities of care provided by OT on the inpatient units. We have Tiara Collins, who is our um, nurse educator for our inpatient psychiatry nursing team. So that's about 100, 100 plus people strong that Tiara is responsible for educating on any given day and week. We have Dr. Greg Raymond, who is our VP of patient care services and was filling in essentially in every single role throughout the development of the six North COVID positive unit, um, manager, assistant manager, facilities, um, probably patient care tech, and uh, uh, even counsel to the, the department chief at times. So uh, Greg was all things to all people and we appreciate him eternally for that. Um, we have Dr. Patrick Young, who is our medical director for the Sixth South unit, but was very integral along with his counterpart, Dr. Jamie Fields, um, in opening the unit. And then we have um, Ms. Michelle Harris-Williams, who is the director for infection prevention across both campuses, um, who certainly was right there with Kish in helping advise us in all things related to opening the unit. So thank you all for joining us today. And um, we will open it up to the audience for questions of our um, illustrious panel. Okay, maybe, maybe we can start by um, more directly addressing Dr. Reeves' question. Oh, uh, sure. With regard to the, um, the staff shortage and the effect on our ability to provide access to care, I think it's an excellent question. It actually speaks to a broader um, issue than just the opening of the COVID unit. Um, and uh, it, it definitely um, has affected access to care, not just to the Midtown campus, but also downtown campus and all the facilities across the state and across the country. We're seeing this everywhere. Um, and uh, Dr. Knight alluded to the agency dilemma where agencies are drawing staff away due to high salaries. So we could spend the, an entire um, grand rounds on this, talking about the operational challenges. Uh, but what, what I'll address in this is that um, we, as an organization, as a system, have been looking at ways to um, address this through um, adjusting market um, uh, market adjustments to the salaries, also addressing temporary um, incentive uh, to individuals that work in roles that are directly linked to volume. Um, and when we open the unit, uh, the COVID unit, one of the things that we looked at was not specific to, to opening the COVID unit, but looking at how would opening this COVID unit affect our ability to keep all the beds open in the face of a challenge with the staffing and the current vacancies that we had on the unit. We understood that by opening the COVID unit, there'd be a high demand of patients being able to enter into the, our space much more than we had prior to opening the COVID unit because we weren't taking the COVID patients. So we would instantly have a shift in our, in our ability or our supply of beds and our demand of beds such that we would have much more patients being able to flow in than we had previously. So it wasn't really so much that we were opening a COVID unit as much as we were going to have to adjust our 
staffing availability to the ability to care for a higher number of patients coming in. And so in looking at that, uh, we're very fortunate to get support from uh, the executive uh, senior leadership of the organization. I know um, uh, Allison Brown, our president of the Midtown campus is, is uh, attending this uh, Grand Rounds, had a lot of support from her, uh, from Greg, Craig Fleshman, who's the CFO for Midtown campus and helping to, and uh, Dr. Goyton, who Dr. Knight um, referenced in crafting an incentive program mirror, which mirrored other incentive programs that we use uh, for, across both campuses and other facilities to provide just a little extra for those roles that are directly linked to volume uh, and allow us to keep all the beds open. Hope that answered your question, Dr. Reeves. Thank you very much. There's um, a lot of questions popping up in the chat, Stephanie. I don't know where you want to start, but there's a question about a comment about, um, you know, it's not just inpatient care. There's also patients spend a lot of time in the emergency room before they make their way to the um, inpatient unit. And there's some questions about um, uh, involuntary certified patients. Sure. Yeah. So um, uh, Dr. Harrison Rostelli has. Um, pointed out perhaps the short length of stay may be related to a prolonged wait in the EDs um, prior to getting access to a COVID positive bed. Um, so that 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 is an interesting uh, explanation. One of the things that we were tracking actually was the number of days that someone was waiting in an ED before they were able to get into a bed. Um, and although, as I mentioned before, the numbers aren't done being crunched, um, the, let's see, the initial wait for any patient during that 20 day period in an ED um, was 2.8 days. But there was a very wide range, um, anywhere from zero to 14 days that someone had to wait for a bed um, on either unit during that time. So not just the COVID positive unit um, because essentially the phenomenon that we were seeing was that um, we couldn't create space on the COVID positive unit by moving a patient who was COVID recovered and no longer infectious to the COVID negative unit. We couldn't move them because there were fewer beds available for COVID negative patients during that time also. So patients who were no longer infectious and were considered COVID recovered often stayed on the COVID positive unit because there was no bed to transfer them into in order to open up a, another COVID positive inpatient bed. And so some of the data that we're, we're anxious to report on includes the weight in EDs, but also includes how many days did someone remain on the COVID positive unit when they were COVID recovered and theoretically could have been uh, receiving care on a, on a COVID negative unit, so. Um, okay, so, and then it looks like um, Dr. Goldwasser asked, uh, how did the move to tele impact uh, involuntarily certified patients? Uh, Rachel, would you like to speak to that as our hospital representative? Yeah, absolutely. So I feel that the uh, move to telehealth or uh, telecourt has really um, enabled more parties to be involved in the hearings. Uh, for instance, outpatient providers, it's easier to coordinate with a patient's previous therapist, uh, family members. Um, I think it's been helpful in that more people are able to be involved and give everybody a better idea of what the patient was at baseline, things we should look at going back into the community and other concerns for safety. So I think that's been very helpful, helpful for the coordination of outpatient providers. Um, since I've been doing, since I've been representing the hospital, I haven't seen an uptick in violence on the units. Um, we've been doing them every Monday, um, just like they were doing before. So I feel like it's been, it's been, um, it's had the same standard of when the patient's being seen by the judge and when those medication panels or anything else um, is happening after that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add to that in that we, of the um, 35 patients that were admitted to the COVID positive unit, 
during the 20 day period that we were open um, about, let's see, I'm just pulling up the numbers. Um, about half were involuntarily admitted and half were voluntary. So 17 of the 35 were admitted involuntarily. That's actually lower than our typical numbers. So usually we're 60 to 65% are admitted involuntarily. Of course, that doesn't mean that they always go to hearing in front of the judge. Um, and that is in fact what we continued to see. So of the 35 patients that were admitted involuntarily, um, only two went to hearing and, and both were retained. So uh, that's actually a, a pretty low percentage um, overall. Uh, during the same period of time, the 22 patients that were admitted to the non-COVID unit had the same percentage of uh, involuntary and voluntary. So it was 50% 50, 50 of the 22 were admitted on certs um, and only one of those patients went to hearing. So three patients retained during the 20 day period. Um, so uh, Dr. Knight, Gloria had to go for a patient emergency. So I'm taking over as moderator. Oh, <laughs> so, that's your thing. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so a question, um, I guess, for the panel is key lessons learned or kind of uh, maybe think new innovations you found during the, the uh, you know, opening of this unit that maybe could be translated into the, into our kind of post pandemic, hopefully world. I can start us off with that. Um, so I led uh, with other OTs, um, occupational therapy groups out in the milieu. Um, and one thing that we noticed with leading groups out in the milieu compared to bringing patients off the unit um, was that we were able to target patients who may be more treatment resistant or lower attention span and you know just coming in and out without the barrier of having to go off the unit or swiped back onto the unit. Um, of course, we were very fortunate that for the most part, um, our patients were appropriate. There are many times where we do have safety concerns and we, it, it isn't the safest option to hold groups out in the milieu, um, but that is a consideration now moving forward. If we do have a safe uh, milieu and patients are appropriate, um, holding groups out in the milieu just to enhance our chances of targeting patients who may be more treatment resistant. Um, also, uh, one of the ways that we worked on building rapport, given the layers of PPE that we had to wear and the physical distancing practices that we had to implement, um, was incorporating more rapport-based activities, um, which we found to be incredibly help helpful. Um, we started off each group with some sort of rapport-based activity. Um, so that's something that we plan to continue doing moving forward because of course it's helpful on a COVID unit or not. Um, and also another modification that we made because we were out on the milieu and we'd have to spend at least maybe anywhere from five to 15 minutes setting up group and some time after group wiping things down, putting the tables and chairs back to where they belong. Um, we created more staff assistant roles for the patients who were willing to help us. So even people who maybe weren't able to tolerate group. Um, a couple patients in particular were more likely to help us with moving tables and chairs. Um, we had some people wanting to help us with the whiteboard um, and same thing with after group, which was something we were able to do while still maintaining COVID safety guidelines of distancing, wiping things down with sufficient amount of time to dry um, before being touched or placed back into storage. So, um, you know, back in the therapy rooms, that's something we can still offer to people during groups um, and after groups as well when we're putting things away and wiping things down when we have gloves and wipes if anybody would like to help in that way. Hi, it's Michelle. That's wonderful, thank you. Michelle from Infection Control. I think one of the things that we learned during the pandemic is we started out being, you know, very heavy on staff protection, right? And then once we figured out how to protect the staff and what was needed adequately, then we turned our attention back really to, you know, providing high level patient care. And so I think from an infection control standpoint, you know, for us thinking outside of the box, um, you know, 
behavioral health has always been a unique population for us, but for us figuring out how we could get patients back out into the milieu, get them to groups, um, how can they eat safely? What can we provide, you know, um, what services can we allow to be provided safely um, without, um, you know, increasing the risk for transmission? So I think for infection control, it really taught us a lot about, you know, um, working effectively in teams and that we really could solve issues if we could just um, adhere to basic infection control practices, we were able to keep the unit um, moving more um, towards their goals of serving the patient safely. Thank you. Well, thanks, Michelle. And actually, we have a, a, a question that from Dr. Glavinsky that I think ties in nicely to that. And he was wondering how, um, were there any additional change, were there changes to your uh, staff precautions as a result of this unit and how many staff members became COVID positive during the operation of the, of the unit? Um, so during the operation of the all COVID unit, I don't believe we had any staff positivity. Um, so by the time we got to the all COVID unit, we had kind of figured it all out. Um, one of the things that you know, we learned early on is that using the KN95 mask and getting a better um, fit around the face was, um, was critical to our success. So in the all COVID unit, of course, the staff had to wear respirators. We had to figure out where in the unit we could give staff breaks where they could switch back to their KN95s. But I really think that us securing um, the KN95 mask and really encouraging and enforcing universal masking as well as environmental disinfection um, really was the key to our success in this unit and not um, transmitting um, COVID between our patients and our staff. So we were successful during the time of the opening of the unit that we did not see any additional transmission. However, we had worked throughout the pandemic to sort of perfect, um, to perfect that practice. I can add to that a little bit. I think what was critical to that is the expertise that um, Kish and team brought and Michelle and team brought to the table uh, with the staff and addressing their concerns. Um, because if you think about how um, we needed to bring the, the psychiatric inpatient team up to speed um, with all of the knowledge that um, had already been gained through the course of the pandemic, they had not had to deal with this like other units um, in other areas had um, to, the, to date. So um, with where other units, other med surge units, other areas that had had um, COVID patients for some time, the psychiatric inpatient units had not had to deal with this level of um, PPE protection. And so there was a lot of conversation that was had over the course of just a few days to make sure that the staff on uh, the psychiatric and patient units really felt comfortable with the PPE, understood the protections that were being provided to them, understood the protocols for being able to don them uh, effectively. And then to add to that, I think what was incredibly effective was in ensuring not only did we listen and respond to their questions, but then we walked the walk with them. There was a, a high level of uh, leader uh, presence um, with uh, Tierra being constantly present, putting on the PPE, with Dr. Knight putting on the PPE, with Dr. Jung and Dr. Fields putting on the PPE, rounding on the units, making sure um, that everyone was visible, co continuously interacting with the patients, showing that we were engaged um, just as much as they would be with the patients, having conversations about the level of risk, um, and that knowing um, that you were going into this environment with COVID positive patients and putting on the PPE where you, know, you think about it, walking into your local target, your local grocery store where you don't know where the patients, uh, if the patients have COVID, but they probably do in the middle of the Omicron spike, right? Um, and so in some ways we were discussing how you may even be better protected walking on to six North, putting on the PPE than you do even in your own community. So those type of conversations really resonated, I think, with a lot of the staff. Thank, thank you very much. Um, 
I don't see any other questions in the chat. Does anyone else have any questions they want to chime in on? Just unmute yourself, or does the panel have any um, kind of uh, comments, final comments before we wrap up? So I, I actually was hoping that um, either Dr. Jung or um, Tierra or Kish could speak to what their experiences were in um, kind of the initial response to the news that we were that we were going to open the unit and how they overcame, you know, what concerns that they had initially. I think the psychological aspects of um, opening a facility of this unique nature. I think I can speak from the, the nursing side. There was definitely some resistance in opening a COVID positive psychiatric unit. And as Greg mentioned, we were really worried about the safety of our staff. Um, there were many a morning I came in early, did donning and doffing lessons with everybody from EVS to our security guards, just to make sure everyone was comfortable. We did spot checks every day. Is your, do you have your respirator? Or do you have your KN95? Um, but the main, the main uh, concern was how are we as a unit going to handle COVID-19 patients? We don't have negative pressure rooms. We, what is the severity of symptoms we can take? And I'm glad we did develop a, a great um, admission criteria for our COVID patients. And um, it, once everybody kind of got into the groove a little bit, they said, okay, this is getting a little bit better. And yes, so Greg, Dr. Knight, myself, everybody was on the units saying, you know, we're here with you. We, we understand we, we, we're gonna get through this. Um, and I also wanna speak to the fact that um, there were patients who were very appreciative that we had opened a COVID positive unit. Um, unfortunately, we had heard stories from many patients who said, I was down in an ED for five days and I couldn't take a shower. I, I couldn't get, I couldn't move from this room. And I was so glad that I was able to come to this place. And I'm so glad that you all did this because now I can get the help I need. And I'm also taking care of COVID. And that was, at least for me, one of the, the most rewarding experiences hearing that we were satisfying the patient's needs, not only with their mental health, but also in taking care of their COVID diagnosis. I'll go next. Um, there certainly was high anxiety uh, with the staff when the news broke that um, we were converting to a COVID, you know, one side to a COVID dedicated unit. But um, with infection prevention, we knew it could be done because we've been able to manage clusters um, in the past and we have managed um, clusters successfully in the child site unit. So we knew it could be done. Um, I do appreciate the collaboration with um, the team, the executive leadership, their presence, because it made our job in infection prevention easier. So when we went um, to the units and we did these extensive huddles with the staff addressing questions and concerns and just basically um, allaying their fears, right, that, that um, um, they're not at risk because we have everything that we have everything that um, to protect you. We we have everything. We have all of the PPE, and if you wear your PPE correctly, and we know you can wear it correctly, you are you are not um, you are not at risk. As Greg said earlier, you're probably more apt to get COVID from from Target than from Six North. So it was that collaboration and um, that strong presence and the education from you know from Tiara from CPTD as well, um, that um, that kind of put the staff at ease. And then once once we launched, it was like, oh, okay, we can do this. So that's it. Hi, and I just wanted to say briefly uh, from the provider side, there was um, I think a level of hesitation and anxiety too, but. What was what I think was most helpful was having um, that clear communication and the transparency about our goals, our timeline for getting up and running, and knowing that we had um, this constant support from infection prevention, 
Um, and especially, I wanted to thank Greg for encouraging us to do uh, the frequent huddles, the town halls, the frequent meetings that we had. Um, because even from the provider's side, I think seeing that we're all on the same page and that we were moving forward with a, with a clear plan um, really helped to kind of alleviate our anxieties. I thank you all for um, for those comments and and I observed a lot of very similar phenomenon so you're on point exactly with what you're describing. Um, I'm wondering about the referral with the park office staff, um, Sarah Kubel, what one of your take home points was from from this whole experience and in terms of interacting with referring facilities who were seeking um, beds for COVID positive patients. Yeah, so uh, I, I know that this was a need that was absolutely critical in the community before we opened. We were seeing extremely long uh, waits. There was more need than there was resource um, out there. And I think we saw that happen as well with other um, facilities opening units at about the same time we did um, and that capacity need was still there um, so I think that that was the right decision at the right time and the the thing that kind of sticks out for me is that this shows that that rapid change is possible um, you know this is a huge endeavor a huge lift and it took so many people and so many resources and so much effort, but it got done um, quickly and effectively and safely. And I think we made a huge impact um, in, a, in a really important, important way. Um, from a park perspective, we also um, mobilized, you know, I think having clear information, having clear admission criteria was really important so that we could communicate that from the beginning, not only internally, but to referring facilities as well. And those close relationships that we have, um, both with our referring facilities and with our reviewing um, docs who are making those decisions was just super critical to have a smooth process um, throughout. Thank you. Yeah, I know you, you referenced the, the medical stability and kind of the, the referring sources. And I had mentioned early in the presentation that we had narrowed the admission criteria. And so um, in further presentations, I think we'll be a little bit more specific, but what we essentially did was um, uh, disinvite uh, referrals for folks who had severe, like moderate or severe asthma um, or who had COPD uh, with one exception um, uh, because of the higher risk of kind of um, spontaneous somatic um, crumping in patients who had underlying chronic respiratory diseases. Um, and so we, we went the full course of the 20 days without any patient um, requiring a rapid response. There were, all, there was only one transfer to medicine and that was not related to COVID. Um, that was for someone who had a cardiac condition that needed follow-up care. And so um, we, no, ha if we had loosened the admission criteria in terms of somatic histories and medical stability, perhaps that would have been different, but um, you know, by design, we weren't trying to expand uh, the medical complexity of patients we were providing care for. We, we simply wanted to serve the need that was arising, which was in patient care, people who happened to also have COVID. So, um, but there were a lot of concerns from the somatic providers who do the consults on the unit and from hospital leaders um, and uh, the Department of Medicine generally about um, not accepting people who could then further um, decompensate and we wouldn't be in the position to help them. So, so we did um, achieve that uh, goal successfully. And if we have to do this again, then I think we have the opportunity maybe to not be as restrictive, but we'll see. <laughs> I'm putting a tack in that. I'm going to push it to the parking lot for now because I'm saying that publicly, but I don't know that 
um, I don't know how it will work it next time if we have to do it. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, any other questions, thoughts, comments from the panel or the audience? I do have a question. This is Greg from Safety. Uh, it's it's, it's kind of like uh, out of the box of what we're talking about, but sort of like a little on the lines of what we're saying. Uh, when we created the COVID unit, uh, I, I guess I'll start off with a question. Did we deploy any of the uh, patients that were not COVID positive to any of the other med surge units to help accommodate our patient's value? Um, so we, when we opened the unit, it was actually on the tail end of a cluster um, that had been resolving. So we had a, a several dozen staff members and seven patients who had turned positive in the weeks leading up to opening the unit. And so what that had mandated essentially was we had gone into opening the six North unit already with lowered numbers, lowered census numbers, um, because of having to separate patients who had turned COVID positive versus those who remained COVID negative. And so that lowered census actually allowed us to not have to send patients um, to other areas of the hospital, which we generally try to prevent because of the legalities involved. Yes. And I'm only, only asking that because I remember, uh, I think it was last week, I believe, or a week before last, there were psych patients on 3 South and there were a couple of injuries with staff. Uh, what I was told was that the staff was unfamiliar with how to handle the behavior of the patient. Uh, so my question is, is there any talk about the future of having a psych nurse uh, deploy it to those units whenever we do that? Or is there something already in place that we're doing uh, to help take protect our, our employees from being injured? Yep, absolutely. And um, Greg may want to speak more specifically, but we do, we're, um, re, we're we are refocusing our efforts on the development of a behavioral emergency response team, similar to what the downtown campus currently offers. Um, and Greg is working with, uh, Someone, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let him provide the details. Yeah, yes, is the answer. Thank you, Dr. Knight. We have a, a doctoral nurse, nursing practice student who will be working with the Midtown campus to look at implementation of a behavioral, health, a behavioral emergency response team. It won't look exactly like what we have at the downtown campus, and it, it won't be to treat or otherwise diagnose or provide um, treatment recommendations. Uh, for a patient on one of those med surge units, but it may help the staff in understanding how to how to support that patient. Um, I, I think that's a very complex question that you ask, uh, Craig, um, and it's something that we deal with at, in every facility within the system. Um, and the reality is that uh, we will likely always have uh, patients in um, non-psychiatric areas that have not just psychiatric illness, but also behavioral problems, right? So not every patient that is having behavioral problems has a, a chronic psychiatric illness and we have to be careful not to, not to mix the two. Um, and so one of the things that we are always open to and will respond to and, and, um, and very grateful if we get support and help in making sure it gets socialized to other departments is reach out to us. You know, Tierra, um, the, the more seasoned staff on the psychiatric inpatient unit are more than happy to respond to any of the units within the hospital and provide consultation to the nursing staff to say, you know, how can, how can we help? How can we help you in the moment to provide some in just in time support for this particular patient? Because every patient is unique in their needs and every patient will respond differently um, in that situation. So um, a very complex question with, the comp with some complexities in the answer, but th at the end of the day, we are here to support and help any patient that requires our, our uh, specialty. Thanks. I think we're past time, but thank you very much, Dr. Knight and, and the panel. We greatly appreciate this presentation and uh, we all learned a lot and you know, great job. Okay, thanks for the venue.